Hey everybody, Pastor Daniel here. Grateful to see you for the final week of our series called The Man, where we've been discovering the power and wonderful gift of Jesus, the man, as teacher and friend and son and prophet. And today we're gonna wrap that up by talking about Jesus as Lord and what that means to us and how it affects who we are and how we live our lives every single day. Thanks for joining us. Hey, wanna remind you to check in. Every time you check in, that only not only helps us know you're with us, but man, it helps keep us connected to you. So if you'll do me a favor and check the QR code here, just uh, capture it and check in for us. Or if you've got the TMUMC app, there's a great little button right there that just says check in. We'd love to know you're here and we'd love to remain connected. So sure help us with that uh, as we begin our time together today. Hey, will you join me in prayer as we start? Holy and gracious God, thank you. Thank you for Jesus the man. Uh, it is an amazing gift of the way in which he lived his life and uh, gave himself for the world and helped people every single day. What we also know, God, is that he was Lord and that he is Lord and that as Lord, man, he just gives us great strength and he gives us capacity and he helps us to do things we could not otherwise do. So God, thank you this day for Jesus the man who is Lord of all. And for that, God, we give you great thanks. In Christ's name, amen. Well, we have had fun, and I hope you have too, learning about Jesus the man. And it's been great to understand him as prophet and son and teacher, and certainly as friend. And what a gift it is that Jesus offers us that. What we need to now do is kind of take just a slight step further, and we're gonna cheat just a little bit and take us beyond Jesus, just the man today, by talking about Jesus as Lord. And that's kind of a bridge because uh, Jesus as Lord is a title and a role that Jesus plays as a man. But Jesus as Lord is also pointing us to Jesus as God and what it means for Jesus to be more than any person. But you know, the Lord, this title, it's a weird word. We don't use it much anymore. I, <laughs> I'm sure you haven't used that in everyday language in quite some time, right? In fact, unless you're probably an Angliophile and watch Downton Abbey or maybe The Crown, where people call each other Lord all the time, Lord of the Abbey, Lord of the Manor, you may not use this word very often. It's a fascinating word. It actually has a secular history, not a faith or religious-based history. Uh, the word kind of comes from the Germanic and Old English that literally meant um, sort of bread keeper. Uh, and the bread keeper was the person who had the bread in the household. And you needed to be with that Lord because you wouldn't get food otherwise. Isn't that fascinating? The Lord was the bread keeper. And then we have Jesus, who is the bread of life, who gives us all that we need to sustain who we are. Lord is a fascinating word that has this secular undertone, but we began to co-opt it as people of faith, and it made all the difference in the world. In the, in the scriptures, in the New Testament, we look at Greek, right? And so the Greek word that is rendered as Lord is literally Kyrios. And, and Kyrios is this fascinating word you might have known before in some ancient songs. And we talk about the Kyrie or the Kyrie Eleison, which are Greek words that mean Lord and identify Jesus as Lord. But, but in the secular world, the word Lord was actually given to people as a form of respect or honor or sort of a title, right? So Lord would mean things like sir, or, or even master or ruler. It's why uh, in biblical days that Caesar or Herod, as we read about in the Bible, these were the rulers of the day. It was sort of mandated that when you saw them or were referring to them and referencing them, you would literally say, Caesar is Lord, Herod is Lord. Domitian, and uh, eventually another ruler. Domitian is Lord. And it was a statement of who they were as the ruler of the day. That's literally a part of how that comes to be. Now, um, we get a little confused in the Bible because there's a slight difference between the Old Testament usage of the word Lord and the New Testament usage of the word Lord. In the Old Testament, you're almost always going to exclusively see it in all capital letters, capital L, O-R-D. And when you see that, that's literally God's name, the Lord, right? The Lord God on high, the Lord God Almighty. In the original Hebrew, that's God's name. And as we rendered it into English, we were trying to satisfy how not to break the third commandment, right? We weren't sure what it meant to take the Lord's name in vain. So a way to satisfy that was to give a new name, L-O-R-D in all caps. But then when we get to the New Testament, we begin to recognize that there's a different understanding, almost similar 
to what it was in the secular world. It was a title of respect. It was a way to honor Jesus, right? But it was also in the New Testament very much a political and a spiritual claim. That political and spiritual claim was huge. In other words, if I were to say Jesus is Lord, I was clearly saying Caesar is not. And you can well imagine that that would create a big stir, right? If, if Jesus is Lord, it literally means Caesar can't be Lord because Lord is the ruler, is the top dog, right, is the boss. And so early on, this is what would cause the persecution of Christians, that they would literally say, Jesus is Lord, and it automatically meant, well, Caesar isn't. He's not my Lord. That ruler's not my Lord. I don't follow his laws. I don't follow his rules. I follow Jesus. And so this statement, Jesus is Lord, became quite literally the most ancient and now the most simple creedal statement, a statement of faith, right? And what we believe as followers of Jesus is it has two primary meanings. The first is when we say Jesus is Lord, we literally mean above every other thing. Jesus is Lord above Caesar. Jesus is Lord above the president. Jesus is Lord above any king or queen. Jesus is Lord above anybody who might be in power or authority. Jesus is Lord. He's above everybody else. I love the way John wrote it when he wrote in uh, the Revelation, you know, that last book of the Bible that kind of, you know, uh, gives us weird feelings sometimes. But in Revelation, in chapter 19, it just says on his, meaning Jesus is on his robe and on his upper legs, it was written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, meaning quite clearly, he's the best one. He's the best Lord, the best King, the top dog. And we want to acknowledge that. So this becomes the, the way we state that Jesus is Lord. He's above all else. But the other thing that we mean when we say Jesus is Lord is we mean Jesus is God, literally. This is that gap I, I, I mentioned before, this bridge that says Jesus is both fully human and Jesus is fully God. The, the disciple Thomas said it so well at the end of John's gospel in the 20th chapter. He, he just said, um, Thomas did to Jesus, my Lord and my God. And he just makes this real clear statement. I recognize that you are Lord of all, above all, and I recognize you are God. And I want to make that claim with my heart and with my life. And that's what we try to do when we claim that. So look, when we're followers of Jesus and we determine whether as a young child or as an adult, hey, I'm going to become a Christian. I'm going to claim Christ. We make a statement of faith, right? And we say, I accept Jesus as my Savior and my Lord. We literally make this sort of twofold promise, right? Um, I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins. He is my Savior. He has saved me from my sins. And I promise and I uh, commit to follow Him as Lord. Another way to sort of identify that is uh, in these two behaviors or actions of Jesus, He's Savior and Lord. One is Jesus's action on our behalf. He saves us. And the other is our action in response. And that's the Lordship, right? That's us realizing, man, I'm so grateful that He saved me. I'm so grateful that He's offered me this life. I am going to commit to Him and follow Him as Lord. And, and part of what this means is we have to submit. It's not a word we use much nor like much. And we have to be obedient to His teachings to the ways of his calling, right? We learned several weeks ago by as Jesus' teacher what some of those were. But most of all, what Jesus taught was humility and servanthood, and that when we submit to him, we are submitting to that humility and for that servanthood. I think John's gospel records it best in the 13th chapter where Jesus is uh, uh, celebrating the Lord's Supper, and in part, he celebrates that by washing their feet. And in verse 13 and 14, he literally says, you call me teacher and Lord. And that's really true. I am your teacher and Lord. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Man, that's a call to servanthood, isn't it? That's a call to humility. I don't know the last time you washed somebody's feet, but it's a pretty humbling experience and very powerful and reminds us who and whose we are and how it is we need to live in that relationship. So when we say Jesus is Lord, 
when we claim Him as our Lord, we might begin to use some more modern terms, some more modern language. So when I talk with young people, particularly like our confirmands, our young students, I, I use this kind of language. Lord can also mean boss or master, like master teacher, really, or owner, like I own the business or I own the company, right? And so I'm going to follow whatever the boss says. If I want to keep my job, I'm going to do what the boss says, right? Or if I want to keep my job, I'm going to follow the policies that the owner sets, right? So I want to challenge us to think about lordship as boss, that Jesus is boss of our lives in the most powerful and positive ways we can ever imagine. If you reflect on the best boss you ever had, that would be Jesus. If you would reflect on the best master teacher, whether it was in some kind of sport as a coach or, or some kind of martial art or whatever, think of the best one you ever had and how they taught you and man just gave you all the tidbits and wisdom that you needed. That's Jesus. And I want to submit to him and be obedient to him. In Matthew's gospel, I love the way uh, Jesus puts it. Uh, in the message translation, it says it best when he describes how we're to submit or to be obedient. He says here, uh, knowing the correct password, saying, Lord, Lord, for instance, isn't going to get you anywhere with me. In other words, it doesn't matter if we just say, hey, I follow Jesus as Lord, but I actually do follow him. What is required, Jesus says, is serious obedience, doing what my Father wills. Man, that's tough sometimes, isn't it? It's a hard road to follow Jesus as Lord because we have to kind of choose to set everything else aside. Not that everything else is unimportant, not that we want to ignore like our family or our work, but rather we have to sort of create levels, if you will, and that Jesus sits on top, that Jesus is the final authority, the one that I commit myself most fully to. He is my Lord. And here's something we've got to realize. Following Jesus as Lord is a lifelong commitment, not a one-day claim. So depending on how you decided in your own life that you were going to follow Jesus, for some people it was literally this day, from this day forward, I'm going to claim Jesus. For others, it kind of happened gradually and you began to discover that you really wanted to follow His teachings and wanted to be one of His disciples. However you chose, know that it's more than a one-time deal, that it's not a hobby, that it's not a, a game that we play. It's something to which we commit if Jesus is Lord. I love the way uh, Luke puts it. When Jesus is describing what it means to be his followers, he challenges them deeply. And he says this, Why are you so polite with me, always saying, Yes, sir, and that's right, sir, but never doing what I tell you? These words I speak to you are not mere additions to your life, homeowner improvements to your standard of living, these are foundation words, words to build a life on. I love that phrase. These are foundation words. So when we say with our mouth, we must live with our lives, Jesus is Lord. It means everything I say, everything I do, every way that I relate to people, every understanding of how I conduct my life means that it's guided by Christ. Now, do we fail? Absolutely. But challenge yourself to commit to His teachings, His understandings, above anybody else's. That's the goal. Everything else takes second place. I love the way Paul put it. When he wrote to the church at Philippi, he used this great wisdom, and he sets this up by explaining how he had been such a faithful Jew and had done everything according to the law and lived his life in that formal fashion. And then he says this in chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, the very credentials these people are waving around as something special, I'm tearing up and throwing out with the trash, along with everything else I used to take credit for. And why? Because of Christ. Yes, all the things I once thought were so important are gone from my life. Compared to the high privilege of knowing Christ Jesus as my master firsthand, Everything I once thought I had going for me is insignificant. Dog dung. How's that for Scripture? 
I've dumped it all in the trash so that I could embrace Christ and be embraced by Him. See, this is our goal, friends. Our goal is to commit ourselves fully to Jesus. All other things in our lives, no matter how important they may be and how good they can be, are second to who Christ is and what Christ has done in our lives and in the world. I don't know where I saw this, and I apologize. I don't know who came up with it, but I love this phrase. It goes like this. Unless Jesus is Lord of all, He is not Lord at all. Chew on that for a minute, would you? Unless Jesus is Lord of all, He is not Lord at all. I wonder if that might change how we think about our faith, how we conduct our lives, how we love our neighbors, how we forgive those who have wronged us. And what would that look like if Jesus really were Lord of all in our lives? Friends, it's wonderful and a good gift to be able to follow and know who Jesus is as Son of God and teacher and friend and prophet. But most of all, it's best to know Him as Lord, to claim that with the whole being of who we are and the way we live our lives. Friends, if you don't know Jesus as Lord, I'd love to visit with you about that. I'd love to pray with you about that. I, I know any of the pastors on staff would be more than willing to talk with you and pray with you about that, and we'd love for that to be the case. But it means commitment. It means obedience. And it means submission of our lives to who He is. My prayer for you and for me and for all of us is that we would commit to submit to the Lord of life so that we really would have the true freedom that Christ claims for us. Thanks be to God that we have that rich gift and that we can make it true in all of our days. Will you pray with me? Holy and gracious God, thank you for the powerful and profound gift of your Son, Jesus, who really is our friend and teacher and offers us words of prophetic insight that challenge us often. But most of all, God, we're grateful that you gave us your Son as Savior so that we could follow Him as Lord. And I pray for all of us today that we might choose that commitment, that we might follow in that obedience, and that we might indeed claim with all of our hearts Jesus is Lord. Thank you, God, for that precious gift. For it's in the name of Jesus, whom we know to be Christ and Lord. Amen. Hey, friends, let me thank you. Uh, you are so generous in the way you commit to ministry and make ministry possible. Every single week, perhaps every single month, however you choose to give, man, it's making a difference, not only here, but in the ways we're able to reach other people every single day. So thank you for that gift. If you'd like to make a gift now or maybe schedule a gift tomorrow, you can scan the QR code that's there on the screen for you, or you can always text the letters T-M-U-M-C to the number 45777. But however and whenever and why ever you give, we're grateful. Thanks so much. Till I'm ready, you. You cry.
My sin was heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan, and you called me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing, and your love is the air that I breathe. I'm a future, eyes are open, cause when you call my name, I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, into your glorious day. We have a church-wide focus coming up in September about vulnerability. And one of the things that we know about vulnerability is the first step is better understanding yourself. And one of the best ways to do that that we've experienced is the Enneagram. So on September 26th, we are offering an Enneagram class. This is a one-time class that's about three hours. And the good news is you can join online or in person. So I want you to go to tmumc.org slash Enneagram to learn more about this class called the Unshallow Enneagram and sign up. And hey, while I've got you, why don't you check out our Unshallow trailer all about vulnerability. When was the last time you let yourself be completely open and vulnerable? When did you last throw your whole heart into a relationship, a friendship, a connection. God longs for us to stop standing in the shallows and courageously dive deep into relationship with each other. With God, we can be both vulnerable and strong, both intimate and bold, both exposed and protected. Become unshallow with us and wholeheartedly jump in to deep, meaningful connection. Unshallow. Thanks for joining us online this morning. If you want to find out more about how to get plugged in at Treach, visit us at tmumc.org.